Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are continuing our verse by verse study through the New Testament this series. And for that, we resume our study in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Get your Bible, open it up to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. I'll give you a minute to do that. While you're doing that, I'll just give you a quick reminder that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Don't forget, go there and study the whole Bible with me, Genesis through Revelation, four series, three of them complete, going all the way through the Bible, verse by verse. This is an in-depth Bible study. No survey, no chapter by chapter, no paragraph by paragraph but verse by verse. Click and listen. That's all you have to do at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 10, we covered these two verses, but let's go back and read beginning in Hebrews 10, verse 30. And it says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days, in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. These Hebrew Christians had suffered for receiving Christ. They suffered, but they endured it because they believed that Jesus was the only way to heaven, which, of course, is true. And they wanted to please their Lord, which every genuine Christian wants to do. 33. Partly while ye were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. People ridiculed them for the sake of Jesus. People hurt them physically because of their faith in Jesus. But not only did they not quit during those tough times, they stood by others who were being abused for Christ as well. These people were saved. There's no doubt about it. They were saved. You don't do that unless you're saved. You don't do that unless the Holy Spirit is inside of you. And they proved that they were saved by how they lived and how they were willing to put up with such persecution. 34, for ye had compassion on me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. They had a heavenly focus. They were willing to suffer and sacrifice physically, financially, in order to do what was right in the eyes of Jesus Christ. They were willing to suffer financially because they had a heavenly focus. They knew where their real treasure was. You can tell if a person is truly saved. Just look at their bank statement and see how they spend their money. Jesus said as much when he said, where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be also. 35, cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. In other words, don't quit on Jesus now. Look at how far you've come. Look at, look at how much you have endured. Don't quit on him now. Hang in there. Continue to hang in there because God will make it worth your while. Don't let the pressure get to you. 36, for ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. 
It takes patience to be a true Christian. If a person doesn't patiently endure bad times because of their faith in Jesus Christ, then they are out of the will of God. And they will not receive the promise of eternal life. Quitters go to hell. 37. For yet a little while, <clears throat> and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Our lives here really are not that long compared to eternity. If we're not willing to endure hardship for the sake of Jesus Christ, if we're not willing to sacrifice for the sake of Christ, for the relatively short time we are here on earth, in exchange for eternal life, eternal happiness, a resurrected body under wonderful, on a wonderful new earth, then we are making a bad deal. 38. Now, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You're saved by faith when you repent and you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You are saved by faith because you trust in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. You are saved by faith. There is no other way. But if you turn your back on Jesus, you will be lost. You turn to Jesus, you will be saved. You turn your back on Jesus, you will be lost. God says, if anyone draws back from the salvation that is theirs by faith in Jesus Christ, then God will have no pleasure in them. And by the way, if anyone thinks that this warning only speaks of losing the joy of the Lord in their life, and it doesn't refer to their salvation, they better read the rest of the Bible because it means eternal hell. It means eternal hell, where Jesus said multiple times, there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. It means they will be assigned to the tormentors in a futile effort to pay for their own sin. That's what the scriptures teach. The unconditional eternal security people Scramble like crazy when they get a verse like this to twist it and make it conform to their theology rather than just letting the Bible speak for itself and drawing your theology from the word of God. 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. So what happens when you draw back? Perdition, hell. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. The writer says, I don't know about you, but my companions here and I are going to persevere unto the end. And we're going to have our souls saved as a result of doing that too. Chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is is believing the word of God simply because God has spoken. Faith is taking God at his word, even though you cannot see it right now. God's word is the hard evidence, and faith believes it. Verse 2, for by it, by faith, the elders received witness. God was pleased and is pleased with people who believe him. He writes a good report concerning people who believe his word. Verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. We were not there when God created the universe by his spoken word. But God said that's what he did. And I believe it. I believe God made everything out of nothing. It takes faith to believe that because there were no eyewitnesses except God and the angels. But that's what this verse means. Through faith, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. We weren't there, so we have to accept it by faith. Do you know what those lying word of faith teachers teach? 
Many of you have heard them talk about this. They teach that this verse is saying that God created the world by faith. By faith in his word, he created the world. That's not what this verse is talking about. And then they, and then they go on to take that false interpretation and say, see, your words have creative power too, because you're a God too. You know, that's witchcraft. That's sorcery. Your words don't have power to create. And that's not what this verse is teaching. It doesn't teach that God, because his faith was so strong that he was able to speak the worlds into existence. It's not what it's talking about. God doesn't need faith. He's God. God is God. His word contains power, period. He didn't need faith. He didn't create the world by faith. He already knew that the world would be created because he was already in time before he created time because he's eternal. And he knows the end from the beginning. <laughs> That's so silly. But people will go to extremes to twist the scripture to, to try to sell their word of faith doctrine. What a lie. What a heresy. This is simply saying that you and I, who have faith in the word of God and what it says, have faith that God created the world by his spoken word. And of course we have to believe that by faith because we were not there. That's all this verse is saying. If you're part of that group, any of those word of faith churches, so-called, get out of there and don't give them another, another dime no matter how much prosperity they promise you. They are the top of a Ponzi scheme. They are the, the big shots, at least, on the national scene are making a ton of money off of saps like you who send in your money hoping to get rich. And God is not pleased with them and he is not pleased with you because you're supporting a lie. Verse 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Abel believed the word of God, and he had a relationship with him through that word, which is why he gave God an offering that meant something to him. Cain had no regard for the word of God, and he had no faith in the word of God. He had no relationship with the God of the word and therefore brought God an offering of leftovers, as it were, just to say that he did something religious. Five, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch pleased God because he believed him enough to live the right way. He believed the word of God. And so when God said holy, when God said be holy, and when God said do this or that, Enoch did it because he believed God. Faith in the word of God determines how you behave, determines your choices like Abel giving a good sacrifice compared to Cain who did not believe and therefore had no regard for God and therefore brought him junk. Enoch pleased God because, number one, he believed God and that was seen in the fact that he lived the right way. His faith and his love for God, which was produced by his faith, moved God to take him to paradise without dying physically. One day he was fellowshipping with God in the usual manner and the next thing he knew, he was with God in paradise, and he never even died. How about that? Verse 6. And verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, 
and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You can't please God if you don't believe that he is. If you don't fa have faith that he is and therefore never talk to him and never seek him, then you will not be blessed in ways that you could be blessed. God blesses those who diligently seek him, the Bible says. Talking about people who mean business when they talk to him in prayer. They're serious. They know deep down that God is alive and well and that he hears them when they speak. So they seek him hard and they don't quit because they know that prayer is not a waste of time. Seven, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Noah, 500 years old. A 500-year-old man does not spend 100 years building a boat with his sons in an area that doesn't have a body of water, and in a world that has never even experienced rain. A 500-year-old man does not build a boat for 100 years unless he has faith in the Word of God that told him that a worldwide flood was coming. You have to believe God to begin and persevere on a project of that magnitude that lasts for 100 years. You got to believe that a flood is coming. And it's a good thing that Noah believed. It's a good thing that Noah, Noah had faith. Good thing he believed God. Because when that flood hit, Noah and his family were the only ones in this entire world who were saved. And so we see once again that believing the word of God leads to right behavior, which leads to God's blessing and to his salvation. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing where he went. Abraham believed and obeyed God's word. He followed it, even though it meant leaving his comfort zone. God said to Abraham, leave home and go to a different area of the world. By the way, I'm not telling you exactly where it is. I'll tell you when you get there. You just follow me step by step, second by second. Abraham, in essence, said, well, that's all I need to know. God's word was the only compass Abraham wanted and needed because he believed God was honest and that his word was reliable. Use God's word as your compass. It's the only compass you need to know how to live right, to know how to please God and receive the blessings that come from that, especially in eternity. God's word should be, must be our compass. Always follow it and you won't be lost. I'm going to stop right here. We'll pick it up next time right in this spot. Until then, remember, you can study the entire Bible with me verse by verse all the way through from Genesis through Revelation, almost four complete series at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Click and listen. That's all you have to do. Bring your Bible and a hunger for God's word. And remember, this has been a faith ministry over, for over 33 years. I just give out the word of God as clearly as I can and trust that God's faithful remnant who truly love his word straight and pure and aren't looking for entertainment or anything like that, just the solid word of God will want to be a part of this ministry. So if you want to be, pray for me, please. Pray for the word of God that I teach, I would appreciate that. And also when you take a break from studying at the BibleVerseByVerse.com, click the donate button at the top of the front page right there at the BibleVerseByVerse.com and prayerfully give.
as the Lord may lead. Okay, until next time then, this is Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.